Thanks. Sure thing. So in three, two. Good, good afternoon. I now call to order the February 16th meeting of the Budget Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the Chair of the Committee, at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison, may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Bean if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Bean, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Mr. Kuhn. Here. Ms. Causey. Ms. Hen. Yes, Ms. Causey's here. Here. Ms. Hen, you were here too? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Ms. Mack. Here. Mr. McMillian. Yes. All right, thank you, Ms. Bean. Please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. Boswell McComas. Present. Mr. Hartlove. Present. Dr. Lembo Wisted. Present. Mr. Corns. Present. Ms. Stansberry. Present. Mr. Tantliff. Mr. Tantliff. You must be on mute. Present. Thank you. All right, um, thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to um, welcome Mr. Hartlove, uh, the new CFO. We're glad you could join us. We look forward to having a, an engaging discussion this evening about the various topics we have listed. Um, I, I'm not sure you've been on, you've been here for a week or two at this point? Two and a half days, three days. Two, two, <laughs> all right, right into the fire, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. I'm excited to be here and it's been a fun couple of days. Okay. Well, hopefully we can keep the fun rolling. <laughs> this is the fun committee. <laughs> this is this is the fun committee. Yes, Mr. Tantliff, I would fully agree with that. All right. Um, so we're going to just move into this um, uh, the new business item one report, the FY 2022 Q2 budget line transfers. So Mr. Tantliff, Will you please provide the committee with the uh, FY22 quarter two budget line transfer report? Uh, sure, let me uh, get it on shared documents. Everyone should be able to see it now. Um, it's also was in board docs. Um, uh, so just a bit of a review background on this report. Uh, we saw the Q1 report in December and the genesis of this report was uh, to address board member concerns that when we do the budget appropriation transfer in April, um, that they're unaware of kind of the components that came into it. Um, and so to help facilitate understanding, we developed uh, this report in conjunction with the budget committee. And this, uh, it's a fairly long report and it's detailed but it gives you a feel for all the individual budget line transfers that occur each quarter that um, cumulatively make up the budget appropriation transfer that you'll see later in the year. So this is quarter two through December. And what I'll mention is Q, we will see an abbreviated Q3 next month because the end of February is our cutoff for budget line transfers. And so that, um, so we'll do a two month view update of this um, and, you know, a potential uh, topic next month, Mr. Kuhn, could be 
a preview of the budget appropriation transfer. I won't have a draft of this year's done yet, but we could do a quick run through of last year's just to get everyone, you know, mind around what it what they'll be seeing in April. But in any case, uh, the development of this report reflects all the budget line transfers that offices and schools have submitted in Q2. Um, is this big enough to see the words or would you like it a little bigger? So I actually have it up on a, a screen. Okay. I don't know if any if people can read this. Um, it is kind of choppy. Uh, so speak up if you have a hard okay. time seeing this. Yeah. Um, OK, I, you know, I, I don't see I don't have a problem. I'm following my own. OK, here. all right. All right. Um, you don't actually don't need to see each line. I'm just really want to explain what's in here and you can look at it uh, later on. But what we've done here is every um, section you'll see a transfer that was requested and uh, took place and the justification for it. So right off the top, um, you'll see six thousand dollars moved between activities from activity three instruction to activity six special education and that was uh, to fund restorative practices training for the office of special education so there's uh, obviously a lot in here now i'll also mention what you'll see is there's more schools than anything else if i go uh, down here um hold on yeah so a lot so we uploaded all of the school oh i see with the sorry it's frozen in the wrong column give me sorry that's why okay um what you can see here is these are mostly schools so um i think the committee members know that schools are unrestricted in their spending but uh to, to budget smartly and stay on budget, they'll um, put their budget across different departments and in different areas of the school. But because of the ransomware attack for the past two years, so FY21 and 22, the budget office uploaded their budgets and allocated it based on how they'd spent in FY19, the, the last full year. So obviously once the schools got into it, um, they corrected their budget. So although you would definitely see a chunk of these, there's more than normal because of that. So you can see lots of school budgets. Then you can see uh, some of the offices. Uh, some of these are fairly mundane. Some are bigger, some are smaller. But uh, here's some for magnets. Here's more uh, Lansdowne, Cockeysville, et cetera, Woodlawn. So this is just the principal moving the dollars into where they think they'll spend. And again, nothing will constrain the spending, but they're just trying to intelligently lay out their budget. And especially if they're giving de department head budgets, this is a good way to make sure each department head knows what they have and that they don't um, overspend. So you can see lots from the schools and, and in a typical year we could easily see a million or two move between activities at the schools. We'll probably see more than that this year uh, because of what I mentioned. Um, then you'll see Mr. Tantliff, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry to, to inter yeah. interject, but um, okay. if you could just kind of uh, explain perhaps like one line item from the sure. school so that we know yeah. what's actually happening. Yes, sure. So here we'll go to the top of right here. Um, OK, so in uh, Woodlawn uh, at Department 747, that's Woodlawn Middle's school number. Um, the unit of the principal's office wanted to move money between um, they're taking money out of co their contract employee line, which is 1445 and their stipend line. So the two of those together equal 13,646 and they're spreading it out. Um, actually, so all the negatives are where they're taking money from. So you can see here they're taking 15,710 and they're moving it into different offices and objects, the same 15,710. 
So obviously the ins and the outs always have to stay in balance. So they've gone through their budget, through the different offices. You can see library, the English department. Um, they've used music office. They've uh, just, they're moving money around the school. It's net neutral. So none of this is an increase in the budget, but they're just putting it uh, to where they believe uh, they'll most likely spend the money and the principal is probably giving different departments budgets by doing it this way. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. And th these are just uh, the attributes of the account string, the unit, the object, and the object name, and the activity, which again is the key thing that the board approves um, when they adopt the budget. And that's what the county council approves when they adopt the budget. It's movement between activities is what we're um, really reviewing here. So, okay. Uh, so, really, so I think you've given us an overview of what we're looking at. I'm going to open it up to board members because I know we're sure. limited on time. So, yeah. if they have any specific questions regarding this, um, please let me know. All right, Miss Miss Mack, uh, you're on mute, but please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for this, Mr. Tantliff. Um, my question is, first of all, this is very helpful, but are there any bats that the board that are brought to the board that are not a combination of transfers in the schoolhouse? Are there bats that are solely transfers of money that is held at the central office level? Yes, there's uh, significant amounts. So uh, on the budget line transfer here, you can see um, right up here, CNI um, is moving money for training. So they're taking $6,000 out of activity three, which is instruction and moving it into um, activity six, which is special education. So uh, they looked within their budget, where did, where did they think they had a little extra money and they moved it to where they needed this particular spending. But when you present a bat to the board, um, it doesn't appear, I, I don't remember seeing like all of this detail. So somehow or another, it's aggregated up to a, a higher level. Um, is that, so would we have, for, for the example you just provided, would one bat be brought to the board or would, that the bat that includes that six thousand dollar transfer also include an aggregated portion of what you show at the schoolhouse level. Um, so when we come to you in April, and again, if you'd like to see a preview of last year's next month, we could do that. Um, we are taking the summation of hundreds, if not thousands, of individual line items, and we're giving you the primary reason. So they're. Uh, you know, something that caused a large dollar movement. Um, so we're trying to give you the primary reasons. It might be principal, you know, moving their school budgets. And we're going to be moving hundreds of thousands, at times millions, to make sure that we're covered in each activity by year end. So the, the main thing we want to ensure is that by activity, at year end, after the board approved the budget appropriation transfer, that we will be underspent in each of those activities. Now, I expect this year we we may see a little less activity than in most years because of the excessive number of vacancies that we have, and you're all aware of. That's causing us to have more underspending than we typically see. So even having budget appro budget line transfers they still may be absorbed within um, the underspending in salaries. So in other words, some money might be moving in, some money might be moving out, but as long as the total budget is large enough to absorb that, we don't need to reflect that in the budget appropriation transfer. We're just moving money where we are in an overspend situation without the budget appropriation transfer. Thank you. And could you explain, and I don't know the best way to point out to you when I'm looking at Department 064, there are holdback amounts of 721,150, 197, 273, 137, 335. Could you just provide a little bit more information about those? Sure. Um, Holdback funding is reflects the dollars that we hold centrally 
and push out eventually to the schools. So the biggest example of that and what, what's driving it, and you wouldn't see this every month, um, but when we push out the school budgets, we in April, so in April this year, we'll push out the FY23 school budgets. We give them 85% of their expected budget based on the one year enrollment projections. The reason we do that is because the enrollment projections can never be exactly accurate and enrollment might be higher, it might be lower. So we give them 80, so if the school, if we thought they were gonna get $100,000, we'd push out 85,000 in April, they would get into performance budgeting, they'd allocate it. But then in November, which is reflected here, we would say, okay, you're exactly at 100,000, here's your extra 15,000, now allocate that. So we hold it back to begin with, and then we push it out to the schools. Now this year we had a, a handful of schools who uh, actually didn't even reach their 85% threshold because a lot of the enrollment, as you know, didn't bounce back. Now we didn't reduce anyone below that 85%, but there were several schools that either didn't get any extra money or they got less than they would have, um, obviously, if enrollment had bounced uh, back higher. So this is just dollars that we're holding centrally um, to push out to the schools once enrollment gets trued up. OK, my last question is about the first line, though, specifically the 721,000 that the object name there is contract employees. Can you provide a little bit more information on that? Um, let me. Uh, let me just look. Uh, let me just look at. Let me just unhide everything here. So I believe that is just where we were um, holding the dollars to begin with um, centrally before we pushed it out. But let me just see on the line 137. Just give me a second. But who would typically be a contract employee? Oh, um, uh, so a contract employee would be anyone in the school that uh, might be getting paid as a contract employee. Um, you could have a contract secretary or employee of other sorts. Um, there's some of the, the um, teacher stipends get put into 1445. There's kind of a host of different things that get um, put into that object. OK, thank you. Thank you. Are there other board members with questions for this part of? Ms. Causey, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Um, I had a question. Public Works in their um, 700 uh, and some page report attached to board docs in the September 14th, 2021 meeting on page 220 recommendation uh, 3.6 says budget. The finding is budget transfers that are made only during the fourth quarter of the school year prevent the board and public from understanding the financial changes that have occurred since the budget was adopted more than a year before the transfers are made. The board is in effect ratifying the changes that staff have made rather than approving them. With late April budget transfers, the board's authority is undermined because it has no re reasonable time frame to understand the transfers and consider alternatives. Uh, it goes on. So the recommendation is that there are three or more budget allocation transfers throughout the year. Uh, the time frame for implementation was suggested to be October 2021. So I'm wondering, uh, is that being considered? Um, is that your department, Mr. Tantliff, or where in the system should that be considered? Um, we're addressing that, Ms. Causey, by, by um, this report that we're showing to you. It actually wouldn't make any sense to do multiple bu budget appropriation transfers that the board approves throughout the year, because if you think about it, uh, A, things are changing throughout the year. So at the end of Q1, we may not know that we're potentially going to overspend in an activity, and um, we may be 
showing overspending in activity one that then gets offset in activity in uh, quarter two, so we'd be chasing our tail. We, it doesn't make any sense to really do that until we have a really um, good line on what our expenditures will be for the year and exactly how much needs to be moved to ensure that we don't go over budget in any activity. And again, um, you know, working with the committee and Ms. Hen going into this year, uh, we thought this would be a very good solution to keep the board informed of the transfers as they are occurring throughout the year. Thank you for that answer. I'm not sure that I agree with your conclusion. Um, the next thing is item 3-7, which is on page 222 planning. It says BCPS should modify its practices of underestimating staffing vacancies at 2% when the number of vacancies has been consistently closer to 4% annually so that those vacancies the benefits and salaries would be known quarter by quarter that are not used. Um, and that is something that could be helpful for the board to understand sooner rather than later, as well as the county council who also is supposed to approve the transfers. Uh, so is that being considered in the budget that was uh, already presented to the board? Can you say what your, what's your question, Ms. Quasi? specifically uh, public works report page 222 has bcps modified its practice of underestimating oh, staffing okay. vacancies i got at it two percent rather than uh, we we don't um uh our vacancies that we plan vary by activity based on our historical um view of what's happened um we have to plan conservatively because we don't know how, um, uh, what our fill rates will be, how our vacancies will look, and what unanticipated expenditures may occur throughout the year. So um, if you think about it, uh, what they're talking about in terms of our total budget is very, very small. Adding another one or two, you know, having a 2% vacancy on a budget on an operating budget approaching $2 billion is very modest. The dollars obviously get into the tens of millions of dollars because it's so big, but we feel uh, the way we budget is very prudent and is in line with um, most LEAs in Maryland. Um, any money that is underspent gets returned and reused the following year so uh, if you look in the budget book, we've had the last several years about $32 million of fund balance used as a source. So it's just in, in a system our size, we, uh, if we took away that cushion, we would be um, at risk and we absolutely cannot ever overspend our budget in aggregate. Could you explain what the risk is related to um, over Ms. Causey, Ms. Causey, I, I yes, appreciate these these questions, but we're, we've already used our time for this item, um, and I would like to see if other members have questions before moving on, and maybe we can come back to it since we have two other items that we're going to be reviewing tonight. So, I, thank you. Right. Thanks. Uh, Mr. McMillian, do you have any specific questions that you would like answered right now uh, regarding this? No, thank you. Uh, Ms. Han, do you have any specific questions you would like to have answered right now? Just one, just one briefly, and we can always return to this, Mr. Kuhn. Um, I have a follow up to Mrs. Causey's question, and that had to do with board approval of the transfers um, and whether or not there's a mechanism of approval if it looks like we're going to either overspend or underspend a particular area. Um, before it comes to the board in the bat, um, if there's another mechanism, if Mr. Tantliff could speak to that. And and I do know that we had you know talked about this report and this is very helpful, so thank you. Um, but is there some other mechanism um, that allows us, one, to detect it, and two, is there a control that allows us to require authorization before um, incurring the expenditures, um, in the line 
in the area in which we are either overspending or I guess underspending of an area if it's um, being spent in another area. And, and one particular example um, that's of concern is if we underspend on salaries, which is a huge percentage of our budget um, because of vacancies, and that comes to us in, in the bat as being transferred to other areas. Um, that's an area of concern for the board because if we're not filling those positions frequently, that that is being spent in other areas. So thank you. Um, so the first thing I'd say, Ms. Hen, in terms of vacancies, um, especially when it comes to the schoolhouse, we are absolutely never not filling positions to generate vacancy dollars. HR is trying as absolutely hard as they can to fill vacancies. Um, so I think you were kind of implying, well, we're moving dollars out of um, positions and funding other things with it. That That is not the case. It's just that when we find ourselves in a situation where we haven't filled positions by as we approach the year end, and we know that we're going to underspend in a certain activity, that gives us the flexibility to move dollars out of that activity into another area where we may be overspending. Um, as I mentioned before, it's difficult to, if we did it throughout the year, we would be doing and potentially redoing and undoing um, work because things change as we go out, as we move throughout the year. So that was the hope that this report would give you a feel for what's changing. Um, but when we do do our uh, budget appropriation transfer, we try to explain what's happening. And, and I know it's uh, complicated and I completely appreciate um, where you and Ms. Causey and Ms. Mack are coming from. Um, but we really try to be very transparent. We have good controls in place. Um, if there's an area that's going to be overspent, um, the CFO and the superintendent will be informed of those significant charges um, as they're occurring. But uh, like I said, things could change. We may not know how much cushion we're going to have. So it may look like we're going to be pretty tight. But, uh, you know, in November or December, by, by the time we get to March, um, it looks like that activity is okay, so we don't need to do a budget appropriation transfer um, because we had more vacancies than we expected. But if we actually did one earlier in the year, then we would need to have board approval, take that action, make the change, and it may not have been necessary. So it really does make sense to, make, to take the action only once during the year as we get towards the end of the year. If the committee um, if there's more information they'd like throughout the year, we can certainly devise additional information, reports, et cetera. But I think having an actual BAT approved by the board once towards the end of the year really uh, makes a lot of sense. And we would, like I've said, be, we'd be working and then undoing that work as the year goes on without that. Thank All right, you thank for that you. explanation. I think the... Um, the concern would be in the example that you cited of when it appears that we're not going to fill positions as it gets closer to the year and those um, funds are moved to other priorities, whether they be priorities that were in the budget or not. And I think the board's concern would be um, if they are moved to items that the board did not approve in the budget because what we, it, it negates our approval. And I think that's what Mrs. Causey was speaking to. Um, that we approve a budget with certain expectations and approving a bat after the fact negates that approval. So I think that was what she was communicating is how do we, um, how are we proactively um, addressing that? So thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Thanks. I, um, I, I think we're going to have to take this item and maybe make it an agenda item going forward in preparation for the actual bat uh, at the end of the year. Um, before we move on um, real quick, Mr. Tantliff, this is f the report you provided us is for Q2. Um, and are you, so I'm just going to ask that you provide uh, the members of this committee with the Q1 report 
Um, and then when the Q3 report comes available, which will be at the end of the March, you know, just make this like a, an, an update. Maybe it'll be an informational update uh, at the next meeting. I'm sorry, and at the, next, the following meeting in April uh, so that we can have these and, and share this information so we can understand it. Um, I do have one question for you because we are talking and you know, we always talk about um, the fact that we have are unable to hire, you know, everyone we'd like to hire right in a timely manner. Uh, does the funding for teachers, does any of that go to pay for actual subs for the positions that we have not filled? Because I'm I'm thinking if we have the positions we need, <laughs> we need someone there teaching. Is is there, does money flow naturally that way or no? We uh, budget for, we have a central substitute budget and that's where those expenditures hit. Um, so for elementary schools and for all long-term subs, elementary and secondary, uh, those expenditures all hit the central substitute account. Uh, for secondary schools, short-term subs, we actually give them a budget that they um, manage. And so actually in the next uh, agenda item where I show you know, the, the per pupil allocations in the schools, you'll see the secondary schools get a sub budget. But if for some reason subs are running um, excessively and they run over budget, essentially that would be covered by vacancies and teacher salaries because they're all in the same activity. Okay, well you've you have naturally trans you know transitioned to item two naturally <laughs> item two report per pupil on title one budget allocations by school. Mr. Tantliff, if you could provide us with an overview of this information yeah, sure. and then we'll open it up to questions. Yeah, and Mr. Kirsch, I want to mention the Q1 report is in board docs in December. Oh great of the uh, report we just looked at. But it's not in not in this committee's board docs. It's in committee board docs for December. Oh, we oh, reviewed for December. it. Yeah, we reviewed okay. it. We reviewed Q1 in either November or December. All right, thank you. I'll let you. Thanks. I'll I'll let you know which month. Thanks. Um. So, uh, the this report was an attempt to show the committee what dollars are actually. Um, planned at the schoolhouse that the principal manages. So uh, just really quick before I show you that, here is the per pupil amounts that schools get issued. So when we're talking about the school budgets, we've had conversations about the budget being reduced over time because we've, we're buying devices and printing and other materials separately. This is the amount of the per pupil that the schools get. So it's uh, and we proposed, as you know, to go up by 5% in 2023. So you can see uh, 87, 93, 116, 303 for special schools. And then here's the special ed add on where um, any school that has a self contained uh, child, we give them extra special ed money. And that's in addition to the special ed resources, the special ed department would give them. So that's just giving you a feel for, for what the per pupil looks like. Um, so the first line here, we have our Butis. So this is the 2022 reconciled budget. So I mentioned before that we push out 85% in the beginning of the year, and then we true them up in November. So this is the final budget for, uh, for each school reflected here. So our Butis had 374 uh, regular ed students, six self-contained students, so uh, that uh, added up between the two of them times the amounts I just gave you on the last page, $31,894. Um, they don't have any magnet and no elementary schools. Very few elementaries have magnet and uh, none of them ha have to budget their own short-term subs. And the reason for that is because in theory, a secondary school has department heads, there's planning time, there's um, schedules th where they're changing class throughout the day, and the principal has more flexibility to try to cover those classes with staff instead of using a substitute teacher. Elementary schools don't really have that. Um, Arbutus, and we're gonna have um, a deep look from Michelle Stansberry and Dr. Uh, Wisted after uh, as the next part of the presentation, but their Title I allocation you can see is very large compared to their per pupil, 
$215,000. So um, our butis had a total of 247. And these other two columns here, COP is concentration of poverty. That's one of the um, blueprint for Maryland future new grants that were developed. So uh, in addition to enhancing uh, most of the old Thornton um, formula, there were also new grants that are included in, um, in the blueprint formula. So schools got two different types of concentration of poverty grants, and those get managed at the school level also. So that really the first tab is elementary schools. I don't know if there's an, any line you want me to look at. Um, the board, the committee has these reports, but you can see here every elementary school and how many dollars they have in each of the buckets. Uh, then there was another tab. Uh, you all have a PDF, so it'll just scroll straight through. Here's middle schools, and you can see in middle schools, everyone has their own short-term substitute budget. Um, you can see Title I here. You can see there are, uh, as you know, some middle school magnet programs. And let me freeze this. You freeze paint. And then um, you can see, obviously, we don't have as many middle schools. And, you know, you can see the grand totals. And obviously, it goes up. You know, middle schools get more than elementary. High school get more than middle, middle school. Um, what you'll also see, though, is Title I. Uh, there's no Title I dollars in high schools. So, um, you, you know, that piece of it is missing. But on the per pupil amount, um, those are all higher at the high school level, and that's where most of our magnet dollars are. So that th this was, uh, you know, Mr. Kuhn and I had a long discussion about how, how can you really show what dollars are in the school. Obviously, this doesn't include all the teachers. It doesn't include all the central support. It doesn't include um, large grants that are managed separately. Um, it includes Title I, obviously, but the IDEA special ed pass-through grant, which is historically our second largest grant, isn't included in here because the positions are all managed centrally and charged centrally to the grant. And obviously, our ESSER grant, which we've reviewed a couple of times uh, with this committee, you know, dwarfs any other grant we've ever seen. Um, and that is all managed separately, even though the positions uh, are for a large part in the schools. We're supporting the extra 15 minute school day. Um, we're doing compensatory ed. So lots of dollars, they're almost all spent in the school, but they can't really be reflected in this type of report. And the last tab is just our handful of special ed schools and programs. So Mr. That, Tantliff, before I open it up to questions, um, could you speak to, and I'm just going to pick uh, Deep Creek Elementary School because it's the only, it's it's the first one that I see that has blueprint COP per pupil funding. Uh, could you explain, is that per pupil funding via the blueprint, is that going to expand? Was this just a pilot and a startup? Or, because I, I only see it in very limited three times i only see it yeah. three times and what you provided can you speak um, yes speak you can that? see there's there should be uh like one schools this year i see personnel but i'm looking here per pupil oh oh pupil. i see yeah so the the personnel grant has been around for a couple of years and for the schools that qualify um and michelle's office michelle Ms. stansbury's office is actually managing this now along with special ed but the schools that qualified got 248,000. Then 22 is the first year we got the new per pupil component of Blueprint. And that's for schools that had high poverty for three years running. Um, and so that does expand uh, significantly this year. Both of those buckets expand and they'll continue to expand over time. And it will be in several years bigger than Title I. Anything you want to add to that, Michelle? Nope, you got it right. Okay. There are only three schools this year, but more schools in the next couple of years. We have a 38 next year, 23. Okay, so 
just so we're clear, because you said it's going to be bigger than Title One, and Title One oh, is federal money. Correct. Correct. This blueprint money is all state money. Correct. Okay. I just want to clarify where it's coming from. Yes, um, you're correct. And the Title One money does not go away. It, this is all on top of. Correct? On top of, yes. All right. So I'm going to open it up for questions. I'm going to start with Ms. Hen this time and go backwards. Ms. Hen, do you have any questions for this poor pupil allocation discussion? Not as of now. Um, if you could maybe come back to me, Mr. Kuhn. I'll okay. Let Mr. McMillian, do you have any questions that you'd like the group to address? Yeah, I'm just curious about that COP, the blueprint COP personnel money. So those schools are getting $248,000. So they can use that to bring in aides or whatever. Like if they had, you know, 10 aides at twenty dollars at uh, $24,000 a piece, is that what they're using it for, something like that? No, there's, um, there's a required community school coordinator that's paid for out of those funds. Um, you are required to have uh, medical personnel in each of those schools, which we, we had a nurse already, but we did buy, um, do some aides with that money. And then the rest of it is is primarily used for a variety of different wraparound services. So it's 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 um, I guess I'd say there's some flexibility, but it's it's defined as wraparound services. And then there's a little interpretation of what is a wraparound service, for instance. Is it the principal's responsibility to uh, follow those guidelines on how to use that money? Um, we give them a lot of help. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Causey, do you have any questions regarding this? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Kuhn. And thank you for this presentation and developing uh, this report. It's very helpful. Um, <clears throat> on page um, 201 of the public works report, uh, they spoke to issues uh, related to fiscal services um, and they proposed that there were two background data measures, which include per pupil expenditures by school and per pupil expenditures by LEA. And I know that I've looked up in the past from Baltimore City schools where you can go and look at their schools and then they have that uh, budget for that school allocated. Um, so I'm curious about the uh, fiscal department's um, analysis of the public works recommendation for that. And if you have reviewed the Baltimore City um, website to see how they allocate per pupil and per school. Um, so uh, I'd answer that in two parts. The first, um, and we, we could uh, do this as an agenda item, another thing uh, Mr. Kuhn and I discussed, there's a report called ESSA, E-S-S-A, which we started reporting a couple years ago, and we're required to allocate um, all the dollars that are in the schools to each school. So there's staffing, um, et cetera. Um, there's some things we know are in the school and some things we just have to make some assumptions and allocate it. So we do have a report which we could share um, which gets submitted to MSDE uh, this year. Let's see, so 20 is completed. 21 may be approved now. I'll have to check, um, but we could share that, which shows what we believe the dollars are per school. The, the thing I'll say about Baltimore City is they use a way to budget called Fair Student Funding, and they have pushed almost all the dollars to the principal that we budget centrally. So in other words, we budget all the salaries centrally for the schools. We give the schools the staff they need. What Baltimore City does is where uh, we have a very small per pupil, as I showed you, because this is really just discretionary dollars for the principal. Baltimore City, it might be $6,000 a child. So if you're at a large school in Baltimore City, our large high school is getting 200,000. If you're at a large high school in Baltimore City, as a principal, you could be getting $10 million. 
Now, from a practical standpoint, it's not that they're necessarily doing anything, but they need to staff their school with those dollars. So they're having to worry that it ends up being a precise amount for them to, to put their teachers in their classroom. Um, and then they, they have these dramatic adjustments in the fall when their enrollment gets trued up. So they are able to show a much more detailed by school budget because of the methodology they do that there are only probably a couple dozen districts in the country that have chosen to do it all out like they do. Um, and, you know, that's a long discussion we could have another day, but it, it makes it very difficult to budget, but it does allow them to at least in a public facing manner show a more detailed by school budget. It's not really more. It, yeah, it's it's just a public facing a, a way of showing, I think. Thank you. Could you reiterate the reports that are sent to MSCE that are already available? Um, the the ESSA report. That was that replaced no child left behind. Yes. Uh, and so that report, the sec, like I said, the second one, uh, I'll have to just check if it's fully submitted. It was close, or I think it was submitted but not approved or blessed by MSD yet. So it takes a long time. The report's very cumbersome. It takes a long time to put together and a long time for MSD to approve. Okay, and when is that submitted to the board? Um, I'll, I don't know if that gets submitted to the board. I don't believe it does, but we and, can check. And all of that data is posted out on MSDE's website. Yeah. So you can compare uh, jurisdictions. So ultimately that will be posted and you can go back and look at, at several years in, in, the, in the past uh, as well, out on, out on MSDE's uh, website. So it's a public publicly available report, but it is not on the BCPS website and it is not present it to the board in a I, I don't believe that report is presented Ms. Causey I'll have to confirm it but it, it's it stands for every student succeeds act ESSA yes I'm familiar with that okay all right do you have any further questions Ms. Causey I, I, I'd like to continue yes I'd like um, Ms. Hen to follow up on having that uh, per, made available to the board OK, Ms. Mack, do you have any questions regarding this item before we move on? Yes, I do. Um, thank you, Mr. Tantlin, for providing this. I'm a, I understand um, and people on this committee might want to go back and look at the October 21st uh, curriculum committee presentation on I don't even know what it was. Oh, the community school model. There's a lot of information. So I took the schools that were in cohort A, B, and C and tried to overlay them into the amounts of money here. And I'm just a little concerned. It kind of piggybacks on your question, Mr. Kuhn. Like Sandalwood has Title I money, um, concentration of poverty personnel money, concentration of poverty per pupil money, and then grant funding allocation. They have, and I know Mr. Tantliff, you said a three year look at a poverty rate, but in FY20, they had an 88.5% um, farms rate. But we have other schools on this list that are close to them that do not have each one of those components. They do, do not have funds from each one of those components. And I'm trying to understand what drives that other than farms rate? Well, um, so we'll get into a detailed Title I discussion right after that, uh, right after this. But uh, what I will tell you about the poverty is that is dictated to us by the state. They send us the list of schools and how much money each of them will get based on the historical reporting of poverty. And the number, the threshold drops each year. So more and more schools go in each year, but like the rest of Blueprint, it basically phases in over a decade. So that's why we're you know, gonna go from 21 to 37, 38 schools next year. Right, and that's on the chart that was provided in that October 21st presentation, but it looks like where the discrepancy is, and this is something that Mr. Kuhn was getting to, is 
Many schools have the concentration of poverty personnel, but a lot of schools who have very high farms rate do not have the concentration of poverty per pupil. So are you saying that comes from the state? The state says yeah. who should they get that us. and who shouldn't? Yeah, and that's brand new this year, so it's just starting up. So that'll go to more schools and it'll be worth more money over years. You just have to remember the whole blueprint uh, is really, this is the first full year of implementation coming up here in 23. And then specifically, and then that's my last question. I look at Lansdowne Elementary School who had a 2020 farms rate of 73%. They did not get the concentration of poverty personnel or per pupil funding. Do, when we see something like that, do we go back to the state and say, this is a school that falls in line with Hawthorne, for example, that had a 73.3% um, farms rate and got both the personnel and the per pupil funding. Um, well, the 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 free and reduced rate. There's different places where it's measured, and there's different time periods that get measured. And so the number you are looking at may be a different time period than the state's looking at. It may be a different measurement because there's different reports and different ways of measuring poverty. Um, so when we get I'm just the list, looking at farms, okay. So as but, reported but again, on the Maryland that report that, card, what I I I pull it up on the Maryland report card under demographic student population. Mm -hmm. Um, and since it's a state website, I'm hoping that it's accurate. I just it, that's what jumps out at me. We have schools that look very familiar, very similar in their poverty rates. One of them got eight hundred and ninety-two thousand dollars in grant funding, the other got 389, and then Lansdowne Elementary got no concentration of poverty money whatsoever. Wait, wait, uh, can, I, can I add a piece that might be helpful? Please. Just a little yeah. bit of clarification. It's actually the concentration of poverty grant is based on a three-year average. So it's not just the prior year's poverty percentage. It's a three-year average. Um, so although it may have been 73%, in the prior year, when you look at the two years prior to that, it might not average out to the eligibility percentage. And so that, that's one piece just to keep in mind. And then to Witt's point, when they do poverty percentages for Title I, they're using September 30th as enrollment, for enrollment. And for the concentration of poverty grant, they're using October 31st for the enrollment count. So there are a few minor differences because of the different date they're using when they're determining poverty and then those averages are used for COP while averages are not used for Title I. Just wanted to add that in. Thanks and remember it's just in its infancy so there's more and more schools that are going to get it each year. Okay I think what I'll do I'm going to put together a little spreadsheet and populate some of this information and then I'll send it to you guys and you can point out where my understanding is incorrect or if there's any aha moments when you look at it. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks. Um, Ms. Hent, did you have yes. any questions you want to follow up with? I did. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Just a brief follow up to Ms. Mack's question and Mr. Tantliff, I think you were starting to go there. Um, I would like clarification around which measurements of poverty are being used for which funds. So CEP uses one measurement um, versus farms rate and those schools that have implemented CEP, I believe we're not collecting farms forms for. So if, is that something you could provide some clarification around how we're measuring poverty and how that works for the historical data if three-year averages are used? Um since we haven't had CEP for three years? Well, for instance, CEP is a good example. We now have 87 CEP schools, so it's the majority of our schools. Mm -hmm. The way we're measuring poverty in CEP schools is we take their direct certification rate, which is way lower than we collect for forms, and we multiply it by 1.6, which is a federal guideline. So, if they're in direct cert 40 percent they would be 64 percent in the measurement for cep schools but 
uh, Michelle, when she or Ms. Stansberry, when she gets into the Title I, she can show you more particulars um, on Title I, but you know, I think that's actually average, part of the COP. presentation. Okay. I'm sorry okay. to interject, but I'm looking at the actual next presentation and I, I actually see a slide that lays out some of the calculations and yeah. you know we're talking about poverty so we're about to get into that Ms. Ten. are okay. there any other questions that you want to follow up right now no thank you all right great um before we move on i do have a comment myself um mr hartlove um, i've had significant discussions with mr tantliff as and other other board members have asked for per school funding um because for many reasons but one we want the public to understand the resources flowing throughout the system to all the schools um, um, and that is just so that people understand how their money is being spent and what is coming to the schools. so i know that the baltimore school model may be a challenge budgeting wise and maybe this is not a budget question but it's an accounting discussion and since you're the cfo I think you're going to have to address this. You'll probably see a request come <laughs> to greet you soon. Um, but you know, the reality is um, we're trying to provide clarity. And the reason why this is even on this you know, discussion point is to push this information out into the public domain so that people fully understand what is going to every school. So I think the ESSA or ESSA will go a long way in helping there. Um, okay. But we should also talk about what's funded centrally to account for the money and the teachers uh, that follow into those schools. Um, this is just basic good government and transparency. So I just wanted to share that and bring it to your attention because I know Mr. Tantle is probably sick of me asking him about it. Um, uh, but we do appreciate uh, the insight that, that, that has been provided. And I, and, I, and I think just to piggyback on that, I think that's where things are moving uh, from the from the state's perspective as well is really uh, showing what's being spent at schools and a lot of the the dollars that are coming through the blueprint um, there's percentages that need to be spent at schools for various uh, for for some of these these uh, pots of dollars so that's really the direction we're going uh, some of it is is system uh, you know how your system can account for things and uh, um, but you know we really do want to show what's you know the, the you know where the dollars are going and we're pushing as many of these dollars out to schools as we can right all right I appreciate that so we're a solid 15 minutes behind um, and I don't want to shortchange this important discussion. So we at this point are going to move on to item three for a title one overview with some Q&A. So um, Ms. Stansberry and Dr. Wistead, if you could please provide the committee with the title one overview and then we'll get into questions and answers. Thank you. Do you want to share your screen, Michelle? Yeah, I'm working on it. Okay. Michelle's really going to lead uh, the discussion to share with you. Uh, what we do in Baltimore County as far as when the Title I dollars come in and in the process. So and some of the questions you were asking, maybe um, listening to some of the ways she explains it might uh, help clarify some of those things for you. Yep. We love uh, clarity. <laughs> I hope to provide you with that today and, and I, I welcome as many questions as possible. So I will um, try to go through this as succinctly as possible but then also I'll, I'll try to move as, as quickly as I can. Um, I just wanted to kind of start with this thinking around um, supports and removing barriers. And the whole reason why Title I funds are in place is to move from this concept of equality to equity and giving students who may be starting school or coming to school with different supports prior to entering schools to school prior to entering school with the supports they need so everyone starts almost at the same place. And if not, what else is necessary in order to make sure students are successful? Listed here are the two definitions of, of Title I, one from the U.S. Department of Education, the other one from the Maryland State Department of Education. Both of them really highlight the fact that the funds are designed 
to support schools with high percentages of poverty and to address active, challenging academic state standards. So what are we doing to make sure that students in high poverty schools are able to um, perform at the same rate of students in schools from more affluent communities? So the way you have to think about Title I federal funding is supplement, not supplant. And you might be really familiar with this, so I'll, I'll move through this fairly quickly. First, all of the state and local government funding has to be applied or provided to schools before any Title I funding is provided. So the system has to provide a methodology for how do they allocate staffing? How are they allocating funding? How are materials allocated? What is the budget planning process? And they have to demonstrate, we have to demonstrate as a system that we have an even fair process by which everyone receives the different buckets you see listed here. Meaning we can't take into account that because a school is Title I, they need less staffing than a school that's not Title I. After the district has met their system-wide methodology, then on top of that, comes the Title I federal funding. So schools can have more staffing, more resources, more tech, more materials, but it can't be in place of what the system is supposed to provide. And the schools use their um, decision-making teams based on um, academic and support, student support data metrics to determine exactly where the funding should be used. The federal allocation comes through MSDE into the school system. The federal allocation is based on census poverty estimates and state educational costs. Once that funding comes into the state, the state gives us a preliminary allocation in June before the fiscal year starts July 1, and we get our first increment of that spending in September. Then in January, we get the final allocation for the current school year. So we're well into the school year before the state finalizes our allocation. We actually had it finalized maybe two weeks ago, um, and, and we had to make some adjustments to the budget, budget submission. So this is one of the topics that I think we'll spend just a little bit of time to explain because it can get a little confusing. So these are the metrics currently provided through to M from MSDE to the school system for how we may choose to measure poverty. The metrics you see listed here are common metrics that are used um, across the country. However, each individual state can define those metrics for their state. Typically, Baltimore County has used free and reduced lunch or meal um, counts, as well as community eligibility. Some of the other metrics you see listed here, some are being investigated as a potential addition, additional metric that we could use, such as Medicaid. Census poverty data at the district level cannot be used in isolation of another data metric. We can look at feeder pattern explicit authority. We can look at TANF. We can look at free lunch. But we have found that we have the best representation of poverty looking at free and reduced meal counts and community eligibility provision. So as you all know, there are some schools in our district that once the waiver, the meal waiver is um, lifted, we've been under since we are, have been in our pandemic, we have had a meal waiver program that has allowed for all of our students in the system to receive a free meal. But once we get families to turn farms forms in again, we will have some schools who are measuring their poverty or determining their poverty using free and reduced meal applications, while others are not collecting those applications and they are eligible for a community eligibility provision in which every student in that school receives a free breakfast or in a breakfast and lunch at no charge. When we calculate poverty using a meal application, we use September 30th enrollment and the number of students who are eligible for a free or reduced meal as of October 31st. And as you can see here, we do a simple equation to determine what the poverty percentage is. When we use CEP to determine poverty percentage, 
we use September 30th enrollment and the October 31st direct certification count. Now, the direct certification count doesn't necessarily take in all at the moment. It well in in the past as of this year has not taken in to account students who may qualify for a reduced meal if they had turned in a meal application. And so because there is clearly a missing piece to poverty there, the federal government provides guidance on applying the 1.6 multiplier to the direct cert count. That would help to account for um, those reduced counts we would have received if we collected a meal application. So you take the direct cert in this example, which would be 100, 183 students. You multiply that by 1.6. And the low income count for this particular example would be 292.8. We take that, we divide that against the September 30th enrollment, and you'll see there's a slight almost 10% difference between um, the poverty percentages. This calculation is uniform across the board. Again, as a system, we can choose to use the CEP calculation for every school, for just CEP schools, or we can decide that CEP schools will use the CEP um, app calculation while all other schools can use a different metric. We are not able to pick different metrics for different schools. We have to make sure that we're using very similar met metrics for schools that are collecting poverty in the same way. Once we've collected that data, we do a ranking where we rank all schools from highest poverty to lowest poverty. This ranking is unofficial based on data we receive from our Office of Food and Nutrition and student data. That comes out in November. We get the official ranking from MSDE in March. In order to determine schools that are eligible for Title I, a, the federal mandate of 75% or higher is required. So any school that it has a poverty rate of 75% or higher must be identified as eligible for Title I. The minimum threshold is 40, 40%. At the district, we have the discretion to go below the 75% threshold, and we get to decide if we wanna do that for all schools or for schools based on grade span groupings. No matter which decision we make, we must serve schools in rank order meaning we cannot skip over a school because they have more supports than another school. We must be able to serve every school in rank order. Once we determine what the school rankings are, we then pull together our stakeholder consultation team. And this team is comprised of families, caregivers, principals, teachers, parents, school staff, central office staff, and we come together and they give us their recommendations for school eligibility rankings. And they also look at the effectiveness data of our central programs. We fund several programs centrally for schools instead of making schools fund those programs out of their school allocation. Those recommendations are then pushed through the entire consultation process before decisions are made. That group comes back together in July to help us complete the Title I grant application. So we have to make an allocation projection. As I shared with you, we don't get a preliminary allocation until June. The fiscal year starts in July. So we make a projection in November to um, con consider how much we think we may receive. We usually do that project projection using a 1% reduction of the current year. And over the past several years, that method has worked very well for us. We look at our central programs, the effectiveness of the data we've been collecting, as well as the cost of those central programs. And then in January, we give schools their preliminary Title I allocations, July and August, their final school allocations. This timeline gives you just a summary of everything that I just shared with you. The data we are using for allocations for schools is based on data collected from the prior school year. Just give a minute to look at that. 
So you may be wondering how are schools using their funding and, and how much of our funding is being spent on what? The very first um, graph you see here is the total Title I allocation. So our mandatory programs, our programs such as our non-public equitable share private school program, homeless support, supports for neglected and delinquent institutions, and our required 1% for family engagement. That's about 3% of our total Title I budget. School allocations take up 61% of the budget. Central programs, which happen to all be staffing, additional staffing in schools, that takes up about 28% of the budget. And then the other 8% of the budget is for family engagement programs that schools implement. If you look at how schools are using their expenditures, about 51% of that is spent on classroom teachers and resource teachers. Paraeducators are about 14%. Schools put funding aside to pay teachers for planning, after school professional development, extended day programs. That's about 13% of the budget. About 19% of how schools use their funds are expended on um, purchases. It could be supplies, materials, resources, for students and families, and then about 3% on central office supports. So I may have moved too quickly, and if so, I do apologize, but I did wanna make sure that I provided an opportunity to kind of catch up on time. Yeah, you did not move too quickly. Thank okay. you. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to jump in with a few questions, and then I'm yeah. gonna open it up to everyone else. So I'm going back to just the slide previous to this really quickly. Yes. So I'm looking at the Title I expenses. Um, so that's overall, right? We're looking at this pie overall. Do you see tremendous variation between the schools or is this, boom, every school that gets Title I money is spending it just like that pie graph? Every school is spending their funds pretty much this way. And, and mainly because schools really believe in investing in people to support students. And a lot of schools, what we try to do is make sure that the cost of a person can be pretty pricey. A school has to pay the salary, the retirement, the insurance and all of the fixed charges. And so what we try to do is make sure that if we do fund anything centrally for schools, that we don't, um, we fund things that will be beneficial for everyone. For example, we fund um, math resource teachers because we know schools need support in math. We fund early childhood paraeducators because we know schools need support with investing with those early childhood supports. Once we do that, schools spend lots of their funding on classroom teachers and additional para supports. They also want to make sure that they have after school programming for their kids um, to kind of extend the day out and as well to compensate their teachers for planning and PD after school. So this is a pretty typical Title I budget. OK, great. Um, I'm looking at school rankings and eligibility. And I'm, I'm also pivoting between the official Title I poverty rankings that were provided to everyone oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and it looks like there was some some big jumps between 21 and 22. Yeah. I just has a solid rank order here um, and my question if we have a lot of a lot of poverty looking yes. at this right so so supports for title one end when you hit 40 percent is that accurate well we have like to under 40 percent you, you're no wanted, longer providing yeah. money right well if we wanted to serve schools that were had a 40 percent poverty rate we would have to ask for a waiver and provide justification to the state for that 40 percent is the minimum threshold um, it's very hard to spread the entire budget out across the 68 schools we have um, sometimes some schools are only able to buy with their whole budget one or maybe two extra people, while other schools are able to buy four or five additional staff members. Um, the difference in the poverty percentages between 21 and 22 have a lot to do with going from collecting 
free and reduced meal forms in those schools to not collecting those forms because schools would then transition to the CEP formula. Michelle, it might be helpful if you gave like a literally a really quick overview to address what Mr. Kuhn just said of just high level how you come up with the plan and decide whether there should be more schools or less schools and then you know the process to present it to the superintendent. Absolutely. So um, we we actually use this. We start with this ranking and we kind of scroll all the way down and find where is our current Title I school? The, uh, of all our Title I schools, which Title I school has dropped the lowest in the ranking? Once we find that school, we then count all of the, I'll start with elementary. We can then count all of the elementary schools within that grade span that are above that percentage. And we try to determine how much we will be able to provide in an allocation to schools if we were to carry every school that fell above or that is above the, the lowest school, um, the lowest existing Title I school. Many times what we're looking at is preventing um, from staff, um, schools from losing staff, because if we have to spread the money thinner, we have to take staff away from schools. They can't simply afford them anymore. And so it becomes a really difficult decision and we put together a couple of op options and move those options through the stakeholder committee then on to the superintendent. And those options usually go from um, spreading the funding a lot thinner and adding in a lot more schools or trying to help schools maintain the staff that they have by maintaining their allocation. So it's a, it's a um, pretty intense process and a pretty difficult decision, but um, we try really hard to be fair and, and really think about the students first when making those choices. And so to explain that um, to your question about the 40%, we don't go all the way down to 40%. Like our lowest elementary school this year was 60, oh, no. mm -hmm, 60. right? 62%. And then our lowest middle school this year was a little further up. <laughs> uh, middle, no. Halliburton. Oliver, 67 percent. So we, we don't even drop all the way down to the minimum threshold, if that helps what you were getting at with the 40 percent question. Yeah, I was I was looking at your presentation and said the minimum threshold is 40. So what you're saying is our minimum threshold where any funds come is 60. That's that's by our own selection, correct. But we at are discretion. Allowed, correct at our own discretion. Sure. We are allowed to go as low as 40 but we never get a chance to make it there, if that makes sense. Yeah, yes it does. Um, I'm gonna open it up. Um, Ms. Mack, do you have any questions? Um, I have one, actually one of my questions was just um, answered, but um, on slide seven, when we look at data options, I think you mentioned Ms. Stansberry that we're looking at additional options. Are we looking at them for, looking at additional options for inclusionary or exclusionary purposes to Inclusion. increase our number or to decrease it? Oh, to increase our number. We are hoping mm -hmm. that, um, I think there was recently at the state level, um, this Maryland has been selected to explore how Medicaid can be added as a direct, as part of the direct cert count. That will really help many of our schools with a more accurate depiction of poverty. We have been unable to explore that in isolation at the system level, but okay. the state realizes that and they have it, they are exploring it. So we think the change will be coming soon. So that kind of leads into my next question. Um, in my three years on the board, what I have been told consistently is that the farms process is very imperfect, meaning there are principals who actually pay teachers in the summer to go house to house and ask parents to fill out the forms. So obviously principals who expend that effort would have a higher farms rate than principals who don't. And it concerns me that children will suffer because we have a different process in different schools and we depend on either a principal putting in the effort to get parents to sign the form or we just generally depend on parents to fill out and send the form back. And I just think kids suffer because of that. Yeah. Well, and Ms. Mack, the 
the the purpose of the form in the past was so that a child would receive a free meal or a reduced meal. So their efforts to um, you know push out and get as many families to sign a form as possible is mostly about children eating, right? If they qualify to eat for free, and there is this extra layer of yes, the more forms we have out there, the higher our poverty ranking is. When we move to the CEP eligibility, and you, you could see by not right. filling out forms, the number got lower for everyone. Um, it, and that's because of the, the government assistance. If we go to that one with the formula on it, on the bottom, it explains to you that, you know, only families who, um, <laughs> Michelle's going right. quick. Here it is, there right? You go. Only if they had do SNAP or if they are, um, you know, experiencing homelessness, if they're foster care. Um, you know, so there, there's only certain reasons they will get a direct certification count, which is why, you know, the, um, you know, we've got this multiplier to, to help raise it up, but we have seen um, over time, like those schools that initially were our CEP schools dropped really low. Oh, no, I, I watched the data out also. Farm. Right. But my, it, my question is, we do still use farms and there we, is a level, we do, right? We did for schools when we go back to collecting forms. We yes, did not collect yes. forms this past year, as an example. No, we I understand. But going forward, right. we have a plan to do that, and it just seems right. to me right. like it's an imperfect system. That's all. I, I know you don't control it. I just want to raise that concern that it's an imperfect system based on whether or not a caregiver, a parent, a guardian sends a form back. Yeah, and only 87 of our schools are CEP schools. So a lot of our schools are going to depend on this paper form. And, yeah, and, I, and if I just may add, Miss Mac, I, I think um, either system has its flaws, right? Uh, because we know with CEP and direct certification, there are families who struggle with poverty, who um, may be too proud to access things like SNAP and some of the formal government agencies that are part of a direct certification, but yet they may be willing to fill out a form to say, yes, I want my child to get lunch every day at school, right? So there are there are flaws um, in, I know. in those directions. And so it really is a human endeavor uh, that requires really the village to, to continue to advocate uh, for our kids, no matter which um, format we use to be genuine about it. So thank you. Thank you very much for this information. I've seen most of it before, but I find it helpful to go over it again. So uh, real quick before I move to the next member, um, one thing that would be really useful um, in this presentation is a definition or a federal outline or whatever, however we define poverty, because we're talking about poverty. And I know that depending on family size and income, the definition changes uh, and that would be useful um, for us to see as we're having this discussion. Um, uh, with that said, Ms. Hen, uh, do, you, do you have any questions? I know you're going to be dropping probably soon for the next meeting that's coming up. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Um, so Ms. Mack um, touched on my question, which had to do with um, the imperfections of the farms process. And I'll, I'll just provide one other detail, and that is that principals have shared with us their concern about the process. Um, in that they have transferred um, between schools and have noticed the the vast differences in the process between schools of otherwise comparable poverty rates in the collection of the farms forms, where some have had very aggressive um, efforts, as Ms. Mack described, to collect the forms, and others have had no efforts to collect the forms. And, and these are the same principles, again, equally comparable poverty rates. So um, I share Ms. Mack's concerns there. I That was one reason, well, one minor reason that the CEP um, process seemed advantageous in that it was um, consistent and seemed more equitable in that it was at least based on the direct certification, which was applied um, consistently. If, if not perfect, as, as Dr. McComas stated. So I just wanted to share that as another um, example or instance where it, it has been observed by our school administrators as well, 
that 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 exists. So thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Mr. McMillian, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Ms. Causey, do you have any questions? Thank you. I really appreciate this presentation. It's so important that we understand the needs of our students and be able to address them. Um, central office, schoolhouse, uh, and the board level. So thank you for that. Um, in Public Works report on page 213, uh, they speak to budget, budgeting and management of categorical funds, including Title I. And they say that uh, in well-meaning efforts many times, the um, and to be compliant, as you said, with governing laws, there's substantial barriers between the categorical and general funds. Um, and what Public Works recommended is that a school board policy should direct that all school system spending be reflected in the budget and that staff make every possible effort to realize scale and coherence in the use of discretionary and categorical funds. Um, and I am paraphrasing to, to meet the needs of all the children in the system. So my question is, uh, does the fiscal staff present all of that funding and all of the resources in the budget from the Title I, IDA, um, and other what might what is considered grant funding? Um, I know that Ms. Mack and I were in another meeting having a discussion about uh, people, personnel workers or paraeducators, um, and that it might not be clear in the operating budget proposal what is the combination of resources available. So if you could speak to how that is presented in the budget currently. What do you want me to, to take that um, on? Do you want to take well, that? Well, I, I would just say at a high level, there's only so much detail you can put in the budget book. So if you look in special revenue, each of the major grants gets their own page uh, and gives a lot of detail about how those dollars are spent. Um, but we don't, you know, show individual school allocations for Title I in the budget book. It would require a, a separate presentation like this for that type of information. I mean, you know, we have a lot of info. The budget book is 300 pages, so we do our best to, you know, present a reasonable amount of information. Um, and remember, the probably the main thing that the superintendent is looking for when he presents his budget is the new initiatives. That's what we're really looking to get the nod on to move forward with. You're really asking about the kind of ongoing operational details. And, you know, like I said, I think think we show a lot. Um, you know, there's certainly probably opportunities to include some more details in certain areas. Thank you for that. And um, I do appreciate the focus on the new initiatives. Um, as we know, we have limited funds. So as we're looking at new initiatives, there needs to be an evaluation of current initiatives and their effectiveness and the value as we allocate those resources. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, Dr. Whitstead, uh, Ms. Stansbury, thank you very much for this presentation. It's very eye-opening uh, and we appreciate your time. So um, now we're going to move on just real quick. We have one information item. There's uh, the corrective action plan uh, for the OIGE has been attached to board docs. There are recommendations that this committee is going to be involved in um, and they are listed in the document. I'll just quickly uh, point to them. Um, there's recommendation 3.B and C along with 4.B. Uh, so we have um, some action items, Mr. Tantliff, that we'll focus on over the next few months to provide that information and the uh, specific um, operating procedures that came out of that uh, that document. Uh, so th with that said, uh, we are just about at time. So um, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The next budget committee meeting will be on Wednesday, March 16th at 5.30 p.m. If there's no further business, hearing none, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for joining us. Have a good Thank night. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Have Thank a great you. evening.